Hi, welcome after the lunch break. Our presenter is Grzegorz Goławski. Uh, he has 12 years of experience in IT and he has also been acting in multiple roles such as developer, software architect, system architect and security architect. Currently, he is lead security engineer in Nokia. He has been working in the security area for about five years. Also, he has been conducting an internal web application security training for more than three years and he has been receiving very positive feedback. So, I want to introduce you, Grzegorz Goławski. Thank you. And yes, I'm, I'm Grzegorz Goławski and today I'm going to talk about web application security. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about three security vulnerabilities. SQL injection, which is a vulnerability in a way how you build the SQL queries in your application. The cross-site scripting vulnerability, which is a vulnerability in a way how you output the untrusted data on the web page and cross-site request forgery vulnerability, which is a vulnerability in a way how you validate or don't validate uh, the originator of the request. And uh, this is going to be a live demo. So I'm going to show uh, you all three vulnerabilities. I'm going to demonstrate how they look like, how they can be exploited, how disastrous they can be, and of course, how uh, you can pro protect against them. And uh, for this, I'm going to use my web application, very simple web application, but also very vulnerable web application with a lot of uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, the application is called Carsbook, and I need to tell you that it's installed locally on my laptop here, so I'm not going to hack any public uh, website. It's not going to happen. Uh, so it's, it's a local application, and this is the application where you can upload your cars, photos, and then uh, watch them. And this application, uh, so we can, you can see your cars here by clicking on this link, but before you can do this, you need to log in. And because it's a security-related presentation, I'm not going to log in using my credentials. I'm going to, well, say break into the application. So usually there's an admin user in almost all web application, so I'm going to use uh, the username admin, but now I'm not going to type uh, the admin's password. I'm going to type something else. And I'm logged in as admin. What do you think I could type in the password field? Do you have an idea? Yeah, <laughs> because the, the first topic was SQL injection, I typed something like this, apostrophe or one equals one double dash. And it allowed me to log in into the web application. Do you know why? If not, don't worry, I'll uh, describe it in a, in a while. But uh, before we go into this, I would like to tell you something. Did you know that well, SQL injection is a vulnerability known for, well, many years, uh, 30, 40 years maybe. And it's still, in 2018, it's still the most popular vulnerability in web applications. Yeah, that's true. And it's even more because it usually leads to the biggest data breaches in the history. Like, for example, in the Heartland uh, payment systems where a single SQL injection vulnerability led to 130 million of credit card details being stolen. So a single SQL injection vulnerability in um, the web server of this company led to 130 million of credit card details being stolen. So that's a huge number, and I hope I got your attention now. So. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, tell you how this could happen also. But before we go there, this is the code I used in my web application for the authentication. So as you can see, uh, there's a web 
login form with two fields, the username and password, and uh, the, the values provided by the user are uh, retrieved here. So this is the username and the password. And then the following SQL queries uh, being executed. So select all from users, and the users is the table where the user's uh, details are, are kept. Uh, so select all from users where username is the username provided by in the login form and password equals to the password provided in the login form. And then limit one to limit the number of uh, results to, to one, to a single result. And now, if the something has been returned, so if there is a record in the database with uh, the same username and password as provided by the user, the record is returned here. And if the record has been returned, the user is authenticated. Otherwise, uh, authentication, uh, there is an authentication failure and uh, some error message is displayed. So, once again, this is the SQL query. And now, if we use it in a normal way, so for example, if we provide the username admin and uh, the password, like a password, we have select all from users where username is admin and password is password. If, if the username and passwords are, are correct, uh, this will return a record and user is authenticated. So, so far, so good. But now what happens if password is like this, apostrophe or one equals one? SQL query will look like this. So select all from users where username is admin and password is, and notice the first apostrophe this is the, the one from the SQL query, which is hard-coded in, in our code. And the second apostrophe is uh, the first character of the password. And this apostrophe actually ends on the password string here. So the rest of the, this password string is treated as an additional condition here. So or one equals one. And because one always equals one, and this part is true, always true, and the whole condition is always satisfied. So this query now returns everything from the user's table, right? And because uh, the code checks whether any results has, any result has been returned, it, it works. So that, that's the reason why I was authenticated, so uh, without providing the password. But, okay, even if I'm able to authenticate or log in into the application as admin user, it doesn't mean that I will be able to, well, retrieve 130 million credit card details from, from, the, from the database from, from, or from the ap application, because th such functionality is usually not uh, allowed via the um, web UI. So how uh, the data could be stolen uh, by using the SQL injection of uh, vulnerability. Yeah, maybe let's let's go back to the application uh, for a while. So let's uh, log out from admin. Let's log in as a regular user, user one. Okay, and now if I click on the cars link, I can see the list of my cars. So uh, now the list is um, filtered and only cars belonging to me, to the user one, are returned. And I can also filter the list of the cars further by clicking on either manufacturer or by the model. So for example, if I click on this golf model, I will see only my cars and only uh, my golf cars. As you can see here, um, this um, model is sent in the, in the URL, in the get parameter. So let's try to modify it. So let's try to use the same uh, string as previously. So apostrophe or one equals one as a model. As you can see now, all the cars uh, have been returned. Not only my cars, but also admin car and some user too car. So with this, I could, well, list all the information, not only the information that I should uh, be able to see. And 
uh, it works in a very similar way as uh, this broken authentication. So we have this kind of SQL query in the application, select all from cars where owner is user one, and this we don't have any, uh, we cannot change it because it's the user who is uh, currently logged in, so it's user one, and model is the model provided by the user. So if we provide model golf, the SQL query would be uh, select all from cars where owner is user one and model is golf. So it will return all golf cars belonging to, to, to me, to the user one. But if I provide this as a model, apostrophe or one equals one, then the SQL query will be select all from cars where owner is user one and model is empty string or one equals one. And uh, the, the double uh, dash characters is, is uh, a comment in SQL. So everything uh, after these characters is simply ignored. And because of this condition, the whole a where close is always true, so uh, this SQL query will return everything from the cars table, right? So, so using this simple trick, I was able to retrieve everything from the cars table. But um, yeah, getting the information about uh, other user cars is not really interesting. Well, it might be interesting, but it's not really uh, that much interesting that we uh, would like to, to it to be. So the question is, can we retrieve the data from other probably more interesting tables using uh, this technique? And of course, the answer is yes, because otherwise I wouldn't uh, ask you this question. But the real question is, how can we do this? Do you know, do you have any idea what could we use as a model, as a car model to retrieve the data from the other table, not from the cars table? but from the other table. Do you know the union operator in SQL? So it allows us to retrieve the data. So it allows us to retrieve the data from multiple tables in a single SQL uh, select uh, query. So this is the answer. So using the, the union operator, we can retrieve the data from, from the other table. And for, for example, we could use this as a model. So X or, or anything, or, or it could be just apostrophe, union select all from users. And if the model is like this, the SQL query will be select all from cars where owner is user one, and the model is X, doesn't matter, union select all from users. And what it does, it retrieves everything from the cars table where owner is user one and model is X, it will not return anything because there is no car of model X in the database, but it will also retrieve everything from the users table. And this is what we are interested in. So let, let's see how it looks like in practice because well, it's not that, it's not that simple. There are of course some details. So let's, let's, uh, okay. So first of all, how, do I know what are the tables inside the database? So in my example, I used a union select all from users, but how do I know that there is a users table in the database? Well, users table might be in the database because it's quite a popular uh, name for the table uh, where we can store uh, the user details, but what about those credit card details? What could be the table name where the credit card details are, are being stored. We, we don't know it, so we need to figure it out. And how can we figure it out? Well, each database has uh, some kind of metadata or special tables where the information about the other tables in the database are, are kept. So we need to figure out what's the database behind this application. Have is this, having this information, we can use the metadata of the database engine to retrieve the list of uh, the tables and the columns which are uh, in the database. So in, in other words, we could retrieve uh, the database schema. Okay, so, but how can uh, I figure out what's the database engine here? So there are many ways. Uh, one of the simplest way would be to do this. So 
I use apostrophe as a model. Hit to enter. It uh, leads to uh, the uh, exception and error page. And because the application is written so poorly, it displays a very detailed error message with some part of stack trace, I think. And by reading this error message, we can uh, find out that the database behind the application is SQLite because we can see an SQLite exception. So now we know that uh, there is an SQLite um, database there. So now we can um, check Google and see where SQLite keeps uh, the information about uh, the other tables. I have this, uh, let me check it here. So know that there is a SQLite master table. Let me, let me copy it. Okay, so, so there is an SQLite master table in the SQLite database where uh, the information about other tables are being kept. So we can use district apostrophe, union, select all uh, from SQLite master, where type is table, because the, um, we, we, we don't want to, to retrieve everything, all the metadata, only, we, we want to retrieve only the metadata for the tables. So let's do this, and we, get another error. And once again, uh, the very detailed error message is, is very helpful. And we can read that um, the request has failed because the selects uh, to the left and right hand side of the union do not have the same number for, of result columns. So one of the property of union select is that uh, the select part on the left hand side must return exactly the same number of columns that the uh, right hand side select. So in our case, well, we don't know what's the left hand side of, of the select query because we, we, we don't have the source code of the application. We, we know that it retrieves some data from the about the cars. So we, we don't know this, we can't control this, but we can control the right hand side of the select, of the union select, right? So we can um, try it out. So we can first, uh, instead of select all, from this SQLite master, we can use select one from SQLite master. It will simply return us a single column with artificial number one, just, uh, just with number one. And we still see the same error. So let's keep trying. So now we can try one and two. So it will now return us two columns and it still doesn't work. So we keep trying until we find the correct number of columns. So three, four, five, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I guess eight is still incorrect. So nine. And yeah, it works. So as you can see, uh, we got a single result. This is because the left-hand side of the select didn't return anything. It was select all from cars where uh, owner is uh, user one and model is empty string. It doesn't return anything. But the right-hand side of the of the union select now is uh, this select uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine from from SQL Light, Ma Light Master. And that's, that's the reason why we have those numbers here, because uh, the web application retrieves the data from the database and then expects that the first column is the car ID, the second column of the of the uh, result is uh, the car manufacturer, the third column is the car model, and, and so on. That's why uh, we see the, uh, such results. Uh, okay, so uh, now we know that we need to have nine columns in the in the uh, result but and we can retrieve some some actual data uh, from this SQLite master table so we know that there is a column called name which is the table name and a column SQL which is the SQL query being used to create the table in the SQLite master table so if we use this 
we can see that uh, there are, as you can see, there are two tables in the database. The first table is cars table, and well, it's not really interested, interesting. But the second table is the users table, and we can see that it has the username column, the password column, and the role column. So having this information, we can mm, just use it and retrieve the data. So user name password and and role here. Uh, sorry, it was not username, but uh, table name yeah. from users. Okay, and here it is. We retrieved uh, the contents of the users table. So we have the usernames, the passwords, actually they are uh, the same in this case. So the password for, for admin is admin, the password for user one is user one and so on. And well, now we can use this information to hack the application further. So to log in as admin user and to do whatever we, we want. Uh, we could, of course, retrieve other sensitive data from the database. And in general, we could retrieve all the contents from the database using this technique. So this is how it uh, looks like. OK, so now how can we protect against uh, SQL injection vulnerability? And I, I'm I will tell you that, well, there are many protection techniques for this and for other vulnerabilities. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a single most used and, well, in general, the best uh, protection technique. So what do you think is the single most used protection technique against the SQL injection vulnerability? I think that many of you would say a uh, prepared statement it's, and it's, well, correct answer and incorrect answer at the same time. I will uh, tell you why. I think the correct answer is to use parameters binding or variable binding. And prepared statement is simply the implementation of this uh, technique. Uh, so what, what's this? I'm gonna talk in a while, but now, why prepared statement? Why, well, using prepared statement, why this answer would be, well, good on the one hand side and not good on the other um, hand side? Well, because it depends how we use prepared statement. We can, uh, if, the pre if we use prepared statement in this way, in incorrect way, we are still vulnerable to SQL injection. So, can see we, s we have uh, the same SQL query select all from users where username is and the username. So we create the SQL query in this way. And then we use prepared statement to execute the query. And uh, this is still uh, vulnerable to SQL injection uh, vulnerability. Why? Because we create the SQL statement in an uh, unsafe way because we use the string concatenation to create the SQL statement. So the correct uh, use of prepared statement is to use this parameters binding or variable binding technique. So instead of uh, concatenating the, the strings uh, to create the SQL query, we use placeholders uh, like this. Select all from users where your username is and the placeholder. And then we substitute or provide the placeholder values later on using set, set strings and int and, and similar uh, methods. And then we execute the query. And now um, we, are, we are safe. Uh, why we are safe? How, how does it work? Yeah, because it escapes uh, the special characters in our SQL query. So let's, let's uh, 
uh, see how it works. Let's say the username, provided username is like this, so apostrophe or one equals one. And how would uh, the actually executed SQL query look like? It will look like this. Select all from users where username and please know this three apostrophe characters. The first one is, uh, of course, to uh, start the string. And then there are two apostrophe characters because um, in SQL, two apostrophe characters are just um, escaped form of the single apostrophe character. So this is how you escape uh, the ast apostrophe character to, to make to make that it doesn't have any special meaning. So now it's just a part of the string. So now we are looking for users with this username, so apostrophe or one equals one. So, so this apostrophe now doesn't have any special meaning. It's just a part of the string. Okay, so to summarize uh, the first part, SQL injection is the number one, security vulnerability in web applications it can lead to unauthorized access, data breaches, or database alteration. And prevention is to use parameter bindings or, or variable bindings or just prepared statements in the correct way. Okay, uh, the next one I'm gonna talk about is cross-site scripting. So what's cross-site scripting? Well, it's a vulnerability that enables attackers to inject some client-side code, usually it's, it's JavaScript, into the web pages viewing by, viewing by, the, uh, by the users. And, well, there are actually three uh, types of cross-site scripting, but I'm going to talk about two of them. So it's the reflected cross-site scripting, non-persistent cross-site scripting, and it's, uh, it happens when uh, the payload, which is uh, injected into the web page, is included in the request itself. So for example, in the URL. And there is also a persistent cross-site scripting, and it happens if the payload is stored persistently or injected persistently into the application. So then it will appear in all the web pages viewed by the, all the users. Okay, so let's see how it looks like in, in practice. Okay, I'm still user one. Um, and yeah, if I, s I see the list of the cars, I can click on the car ID to retrieve more details about uh, this car, right? But what happens if I change the ID to some non-existing ID? I get an error message that no car with ID exists. And I can see the same ID that I entered here in, on the page. So the ID I sent in the request here is reflected on the web page. And it, well, can mean, but not necessarily, that on the page, it can indicate that the page is vulnerable to SQL injection, uh, to cross-site scripting, and we can uh, check it further. So let's try to use this. So now I enclose this number 99 in HTML B tags. Let's see what happens. The number 99 is on bold now. So it means that the HTML tags are were, were injected into the web page and now are interpreted by the browser. So let's see something different. Script. Script, and for example, we can use uh, alert. So now, and the script has been executed in my browser. browser. So, uh, what does it mean? It means that if I send this link right, to any user and the user clicks this link, opens this web page, the script provided here, in this case it's alert but can be any JavaScript, will be executed in the user browser. Right, but so this is this is the reflected cross-site scripting because uh, the payload is being transferred via the request parameter and it's then reflected on the web page. So let's, let's recap it. 
we have this error message if the car ID is incorrect. No car with ID and the ID provided in the in the request. We have the ID is 99, so the URL is carsbook.com slash car ID 99, and the page is the, 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 the source code, the HTML code of the pages, like that. So nothing bad. But if ID is something like this, script, alert, XSS, uh, so the URL is like this, the HTML uh, part, the HTML code will be like this. So we have no car with ID and then script tag and the JavaScript payload. And of course, the browser will not display this as a string on the web page. It will, of course, interpret it as a script and will execute the script in the user uh, browser. Okay, now I have a question for you, but please don't, don't answer it now. Just think about this and I will uh, come back to, to, to you in five minutes. So let's pretend you are hackers and you found a cross-site scripting vulnerability in a very popular website, on a very popular website, and you would like to use it to, I don't know, to make some chaos, to um, shut down the web page or to uh, change the web page contents or to make some money or gain unauthorized access to, to the application. So what JavaScript payload would you send? Let's think about this. I will uh, come back to, to this question in five minutes because now I'm going to talk about persistent cross-site scripting, which is uh, more severe than uh, the reflected one because in the reflected one, in order to exploit it, we need to send a link to the user and the user needs to click the link. And only then the JavaScript payload is executed in his brow browser. But now with uh, persistent cross-site scripting, this uh, clicking on the link will not be needed. You will see. We have on the web page, we have a possibility to add a car. I can just add a, just add a car here. And you can see the new car is is here. But I can add a car with a malicious name. So let's uh, let's add a car with this name. Script alert one. Right? So let's let's at the car. So now this JavaScript payload has automatically been executed in my browser and it will be executed in, well, any browser of any user who enters this website. So now we don't need to send um, any link to any user. Let's, the user just needs to just open the Cars Book web page. So let's say this is the admin. He logs in. He logs in and he wants to list uh, the cars of all the users. And uh, we can see our JavaScript payload it has just been executed in the admin's browser. Okay, we can we can also see how it actually uh, looks like. Here, so here we can see we have this uh, link to the to the car, and the link text is script alert, and it's of course not um, displayed on the page. It's just interpreted as a JavaScript and executed by the browser. Okay, so that, that's persistent cross-site scripting. The idea behind this is, well, the same as in, in reflected cross-site scripting. The, the only difference is how the, the payload is being uh, stored in the web application. So in this case, the payload is stored permanently in the web application and every user visiting the web application will 
um, experience this cross-site scripting. There is no need to send uh, the malicious links to to the users. Okay, so let's go back to to the XSS payload. So, what JavaScript payloads would you send if you were hackers? Do you have any idea? Yeah, you can uh, send, uh, you can inject a link to download some, for example, malware or virus. Yeah, that, that's possible. And then, well, the link will be included on the legitimate site. So there will be a big chance that user will actually click the link and install uh, the malware. Yeah, there is. Yeah, so the answer is uh, to redirect to some other site. Yeah, so it's it's also possible. So instead of um, uh, injecting a link, we could just redirect all the users to to our malicious site, and then just, for example, mount a phishing attack or, or something like that. So yeah, that that's that's also possible. Um, I actually have two other examples that I'm going to show you. And yeah, one more thing that I'm gonna talk about. So very popular way to exploit cross-site scripting is site defacement. What site defacement is just um, just an act of replacing the web page or adding some contents to the web page, indicating that the web web page has been hacked and or I have been here and giving your your name. So that's that's uh, one possibility, and yeah, I actually have an example here. So yeah, let's Yeah, so I will go back to, to the JavaScript code in, in a while. So I add one more current and I just included a, a, a hacked picture on the web page. So now everybody visiting the web page will see will see this uh, picture. So this is how it works. So I just simply created an image, HTML tag, uh, and the source of this image is this hacked image and I simply embedded it into the web page because from the JavaScript uh, perspective, from the JavaScript level, we have full access to the uh, DOM model of the website. So we can read it, we can modify it. So we can do, for example, the site defacement. Another example is um, stealing the cookies. For example, session cookies. If we have uh, a session cookie of uh, admin user, we can impersonate him. We can use this um, th this cookie to become admin user. So this is also a very popular way to exploit uh, the cross-site scripting vulnerability. And well, there are many ways to achieve this. For example, we can use an iframe. So we can include an iframe into the web application and the source of this iframe iframe would be our site this uh, our website hackersite.com slash log and a single parameter with the value containing the actual cookies will be sent and um, if the brow browser opens if, if a user enters uh, this car bo cars book site uh, the browser will try to load the iframe, so it will send the get request to hackersite.com and include uh, the user cookies in the request. And then hacker can see uh, the, the cookies in, for example, in um, web server logs. Another way to achieve the same is to use XML HTTP request API. So we just create HTTP, XML HTTP request and simply send a GET request to hackersite.com, uh, the request including uh, the cookies. And again, we can then see the cookies in the web server logs, or we can simply 
somehow process them in the on the on the hacker side uh, web page. Okay, so let's uh, let's try it now. I will use the second example, so I will use this XML HTTP request. So I'm gonna add a new car here with this name. Okay. Okay, so now I opened this page in my browser and you can already see if you open, this is the web console of the hackersite.com application. So you can see a uh, new entry here because, well, the hackersite.com simply prints um, the, all the request parameters to standard output. So that's why I can see uh, the session ID, but now my session ID there, but now let's, let's see, let's say that an admin user, an admin user opens the cars book and he uh, logs in again, admin, and view the list of the cars. And now, as you can see, we have his session ID in our hackersite.com uh, logs. So now we can use this session ID to impersonate admin user, to simply become admin user and to, to be able to, to to work as admin user as long as he is logged in. So once admin, legitimate admin logs out, the session becomes um, invalid and we cannot, we cannot uh, work as admin user anymore. Okay, there, there's uh, one more example, or well, not example, uh, there I have one more idea what we could do. Um, with XSS vulnerability, so how we could leverage it, leverage it. So we could, for example, inject uh, some cryptocurrency mining script into the web page. So then all the users visiting this web page will mine the cryptocurrency f for us. So th this could be a way to uh, actually monetize. Uh, this XSS vulnerability. Okay, but for now, all the XSS payloads, they included the script tag, right? So we could think that, okay, we could prevent uh, this kind of vulnerability by filtering all the input and rejecting all the, it the input that contains the script tag. Well, I can already tell you that that would be a very bad, bad idea. Uh, but why? How can we uh, inject JavaScript code into the web application without actually using the script stack? Do you have any idea? We can use, for example, uh, event attributes, for example, on error we could inject something like this into the web page. Image tag with some non-existing source and on error event attribute with the JavaScript to be executed. And this JavaScript code will be executed if an error happens while loading uh, the image. And because the image source does not exist, uh, it will always result in, in error. So uh, this JavaScript code will al always be executed. So, as remember that filtering out the user input containing the script tag is not a good idea. Okay, so if it's not a good idea, then how can we, well, what is a good idea? How can we protect against uh, cross-site scripting? Yeah, exactly. So sanitizing or, or encoding the user input. Uh, what does it mean? It means to substitute the special characters by their encoded forms. So 
usually the, 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 there are uh, these are the, the HTML entities. So, for example, if we substitute uh, the less than sign, less than character with this entity, it will not be interpreted as a browser, uh, as, a, as a script to be executed, but it will simply be uh, displayed on the web page. And I can actually demonstrate it because this car manufacturer parameter is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, but this car model is not. So if I add this car, then you can see here uh, this script, JavaScript, and script tag is not interpreted and not JavaScript is not executed, but it's simply uh, displayed here simply because it was escaped, right? You can see here. So the less than character uh, was substituted by ampersand LT and greater than by ampersand GT. And this is uh, the correct way and the best way to protect against cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And the good news is that most modern frameworks will do this for you, so you don't need to care about this. You just need to use the, the framework in a correct way. Okay, I, I have one, one uh, quite funny example, um, because as you could see now, in most cases, the, the JavaScript payload was included either in the URL, right, in the GET request, or was um, added, injected into the da database, for example, by filling out a, a form uh, on the web page. But, well, there is, I have an example of one, well, very unusual way of injecting the, the cross-site scripting or smuggling the cross-site scripting payload into the web application. It's about Safari Books Online. Do you know Safari Books Online? I, I think you, you do. So it's, it's a online bookstore where you can actually preview um, the contents of the book. You can read uh, some chapters. So there was a guy who wrote uh, a security, a web application security book. So of course, one, one of the chapter uh, there was about cross-site scripting. So of course, he included many XSS payloads in the book, like, uh, like I did in, in my presentation. And then uh, the book got published on Safari Books Online. And because uh, the book contents, well, the book contents uh, was, were uh, scanned, but not sanitized, not encoded. Well, it resulted in those XSS payload being injected into the web application in, well, unencoded or unsanitized uh, way. So the result was that users visiting the Safari books online experienced the, the cross-site scripting. So yeah. the receipt is very simple. Write your XSS payload, put it in your book, get it published on O'Reilly Safari books and profit. Okay, summarize it. There are, or we've been talking about two uh, XSS types reflected and persistent. Uh, XSS can lead to site defacement, session cookie leakage, or, well, simply any JavaScript code execution in the victim's browsers. And prevention technique, just encode uh, the output. Okay, do you remember what was the third vulnerability? Does anyone remember? Okay, it was cross-site request forgery, CSRF or CSRF. What's that? Uh, it occurs when the attacker can cause the user browser to perform an unwanted action on a trusted website for which the user is currently authenticated. So in other words, it it's occurs when the hacker can somehow trick our browser, the user browser, to send 
some requests to the website, to the um, legitimate website, but the request is unwanted, so it's not has not been well originated by by the user itself. So let's see let's see an example. Okay, we can we have. As you can see, if I click on my username here, I can change my password. So how does it work? I simply put a new password, click the change password uh, button. And what happens in the background? Here I have uh, a burp suite application. It just works as a proxy, so it, it intercepts all the requests made by my browser, so I can I can see them. So as you can see here, Uh, when I click on this change password button, a post request has been sent to uh, carsbook.com slash user slash change password right, with a new password as a, as a single parameter here. Of course, with, uh, with the J -se session ID cookie because it's, it's required, otherwise the request would be uh, rejected. So now, is it possible to trick the user browser to send such a post request uh, without user knowledge? Uh, yes, it is possible. It turns out that it is possible. And uh, how can we do this? Let's see. Okay, let me log out here. Let's let's. I'm, I will log out. Uh, log in as admin. So you remember that the admin password is admin, and now um, let's say admin opens, just receives a, a link from somebody and opens uh, this link, and he see a single click me button on the page. He clicks the button, and what happened? What has just happened? Let's see. His browser, so we can see here, he, he opened this hackersite.com slash something, and then after one, once, he, uh, once he clicked the button, his browser has sent a request, a post request, to carsbook.com slash slash user slash change password, like, like you can see here with a new password value, which is password. So now the password for uh, the admin user has been changed to, to password. And I can, I can log in as admin. You don't see it, but I am typing password here now, not, not admin, and I'm logged in. All right, so What's, what are the contents of this malicious website? It's a single, simple uh, page with a single uh, form. Here, uh, the form action is carsbook.com slash user slash change password. The method is post. And there are two parameters. Uh, sorry, one, one in, uh, input parameter, the hidden one, uh, the password parameter with the new password value. The new password will be password and this submit button, right? So now if the admin, the Carsbook admin clicks this button, a form to carsbook.com slash user slash change password with the new password, which is which has been, well, introduced by, by the hacker, right? The value password is sent. So the password of the user is changed to, of the admin is changed to password. And this was uh, possible because browsers automatically include all the credentials uh, into the request. So in this case, the credentials are the session cookie is the credential, right? So, so browser, if it sends the request to carsbook.com, it will automatically include all the credentials it has for carsbook.com in, in this request. And the bad thing is that the website has no idea 
uh, that the request uh, was malicious, right? It has no idea um, that the request was not sent by the legitimate admin user because it the request has actually been sent, been sent by his browser, right? So the, the problem is that um, the admin user was not aware that the request has been sent. Okay, so that, that, that's the example I've just uh, shown you. Exactly this one. So yeah, so in our case, we had this, uh, this form and if admin clicked uh, this click me button, and the, his password uh, was changed. But well, does it really require the user to click on any button? Of course not, we can, well, uh, automatically send submit uh, the form using the JavaScript. So we could add this at the top of the web page and then it wouldn't be required for admin to click on this click me link. It would be enough if admin just open uh, the web page and uh, the form will be automatically sent and the password will be changed. Okay, so how can we prevent against those uh, vulnerabilities? Actually, this time I'm going to uh, show you two prevention techniques. The first one is unpredictable token. So we could uh, embed an additional token, a random token, into every request. So we could, uh, when the user session is created, we could uh, generate a random token and well, um, inject this random token in every form of our web page as a hidden input parameter. So now, if the user is on cars.com web page and clicks uh, change me password, actually, um, a request with two parameters will be sent with the new password and with this uh, random token because it would be embedded into into the form, into the HTML code. And the point is that, like, like this. So every form on the web page would be, should be changed and an additional input parameter should be added, like this. And then we simply validate the token on the server side. Hacker doesn't know the token so he cannot embed it on his hacker site. So the request from the hacker site will contain only a single parameter, the new password. It will not include the token, so the request will be rejected on the server site. There's another uh, technique I'm gonna talk about because um, the previous one does not really apply to modern applications where a lot of JavaScript is being used, uh, single page applications, Ajax applications, and so on. So uh, in such cases, um, a technique called double submit cookie is, uh, can be used. It's, uh, the principle is, is very similar, but now we generate, again, we generate a, a random token for each user session and we include this token in a cookie. So we send a cookie to, to user browser with the token. And then our JavaScript code, which is uh, being run on the client side, will read the cookie value and will include it in a custom HTTP header, like this one, right? for each request. And now on the server side, we don't even need to store the token on the server side because we simply can compare the, co the token from the cookie and the token from the header because the browser will automatically, of course, send the cookie back to the server and uh, the JavaScript code will also include this additional HTTP header. So it will also be sent to the server. So now we just compare the, the, to those two values on the server side. We don't need to, to store the tokens on the server. Okay, summary. So CSRF uh, with CSRF uh, vulnerability and unwanted action can be performed on the 
target website without the user's knowledge. And it, of course, depends on the website, what uh, capabilities the website has. Um, the, the, this uh, vulnerability can be more or less severe. Uh, yeah, so it can lead to execute execution of any action allowed on the website. And the prevention techniques are unpredictable token or double submit cookie. Okay, so now you know how uh, dangerous the vulnerabilities can be. You know uh, that they can lead to, to really bad, bad things. So just go to your code and fix it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grzegorz. Do we have any questions from the audience? I cannot see well, but I think we have yeah, there one. Are. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, as you already said, um, many modern web frameworks already have some protection mechanisms. So, uh, for instance, when I use Django, uh, uh, would I need to do some extra work to be safe from these basic vulnerabilities, or can uh, can a Django application also be vulnerable from these three types that you showed? Okay, so I'm not familiar with Django framework, so I can't um, answer this exact question, but I can uh, tell about, for example, uh, Spring framework. So, and. I guess that SQL injection vulnerability will need to protect your code against this. The framework will not do this automatically for you. So we need to use the correct APIs to, uh, to create, in principle, the, the prepared statement to in create Django, the... Actually you, you, there, there's an object relational mapper, so I, I'm not sure, but I, I guess there would be some sanitizing. And, uh, okay, so you don't actually do, do the SQL statements yourself. Okay, so if you don't, then you you are most probably protected. So so that's good because the SQL injection can happen only if you create the SQL queries by yourself and you do this in an unsafe way. So you do this uh, string, string concatenation. Regarding the others, most probably you are protected. And as I said, for example, in Spring, um, this cross-site request forgery is protection is enabled automatically. So in order to demonstrate to you this vulnerability, I had to intentionally disable it in the configuration because automatically it's enabled and uh, by default, the tokens will automatically be added to every form you have on your web page. Um, yeah, and regarding cross-site scripting, it's also the same. Most of the web frameworks will automatically encode uh, the, the strings that you put on your on your web page, unless you use the unsafe version of, of for example, of tags, or you configure the framework to not encode uh, the strings. But, but by default, it should encode the strings automatically. <laughs> 